Hi, welcome to the National Grid's Choice Online News, and today we have a very special guest with us. Uh, that's none other than Dr. David Cooper, who is the senior pastor of Mount uh, Parent Church. And he's going to release his new book called Unfinished Business, uh, published by Charisma House. And it's now going to be uh, available on Amazon.com, and as well as Barnes & Noble, and all leading good bookstores. Uh, Dr. David Cooper, thank you for joining us here at the National Grid's Choice. Um, could you tell us you know, more about your inspiration uh, behind this book, Unfinished Business, you know, and why do you choose to entitle your book that way? I first ran across that phrase when I was studying psychology um, and learning about human behavior. That phrase uh, stuck with me, how that people carry unfinished business in their minds and their hearts that affects their current life. And then in Jesus' teachings, he told his disciples when they went to a town and preached the gospel, if they were rejected, to shake the dust off their feet before they went to another town or village. And one day I just got to thinking more about that phrase and got some more insight into the need to not carry the, the pain of one experience into another. And the, the idea of unfinished business is learning uh, to, to get over things fast, to deal with them and not continue to carry those type of issues into new experiences and relationships. We, we ruin the present often because we haven't dealt with the past. And speaking uh, about the present and the past, uh, what is your observation of a human mind when it comes to memories uh, versus dreams? And do they relate to each other according to our desires, experiences, or perceptions? Yes, the brain stores up to about 15 trillion pieces of information in an average lifetime. So the brain actually never forgets anything. It stores it in what we call the unconscious mind. And even though we can't consciously retrieve this information or data, uh, it is still there and it does continue to influence us. Uh, Freud himself talked about unconscious motivators of behavior. Sometimes people act ways in the present, but they're not even aware, aware of the forces and feelings within them that even shapes their current behavior. And so the mind is a lot like an iceberg where you see the tip of the iceberg above the water, but the, the great majority of an iceberg is beneath the water level. Mm. And the great majority of the experiences people have are in the unconscious mind, not the conscious mind. Dreams are, a, dreams are an experience where many of the thoughts and feelings of the unconscious mind are openly expressed. When we're asleep, we don't, we don't guard or we're not defensive or we don't deny things. And so the mind is free uh, to process all this data. And that's the dreams are scrambled up sometimes, a scrambling of information. A lot of fears and feelings uh, happen during dreams. I think it, a dream is a place where the mind is trying to process sometimes a lot of painful or repressed or fearful memories. And speaking about memories, uh, right now we're going to open uh, this floor right now. Uh, questions that's been uh, submitted by uh, audiences around the world. And this program is sponsored by Charisma Media and is made possible by Charisma. Uh, we have a question right now uh, from Malaysia for you, uh, Dr. Uh, Doctor, uh, <clears throat> sorry, pardon me, uh, Dr. David Cooper. Uh, the question from Malaysia is, is, how can a person get rid of the past and painful experiences and repress memories? Is it really wrong to keep them? And how can I do it without emotionally expressing it and confessing, confessing, uh, confessing it publicly that would embarrass my future reputation? Well, there, there's no way to get rid of, of memories because you can't erase the brain. I guess you could have surgery and then you wouldn't remember anything. Or you could have trauma and wouldn't remember anything. But uh, memories are an important part of our story. I think coming to terms with the real story of our lives is important. Sometimes when people have been through painful experiences, they'll deny those experiences or refuse to deal with them. We call that repression, where people push things down into the unconscious because they don't want to deal with it. It's better to face the reality of our lives and what we've lived through. That's a part of the story of all of our lives instead of uh, trying to edit our lives. You know, face the whole story of who you are. Uh, I think it's important to openly express feelings, no matter what those feelings are. Uh, to someone in some kind of a relationship. It's very uh, unhealthy for anybody to repress their feelings and not to express uh, what they're feeling in the moment. It is in the expression of those feelings that people are able sometimes 
to deal with them or the intensity of the feelings settle down where that they don't uh, interfere with our lives. And so we have another question that's from Korea, uh, who's a counselor and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a critic. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the symptoms, uh, Dr. Cooper, that a person usually avoids uh, express, expressing the feelings and facing uh, realities? Uh, sometimes people are withdrawn, and that depends on the nature. Uh, if a person was repressing grief as opposed to repressing anger, uh, their, their symptoms would be very, very different. Uh, a lot of uh, illnesses like headaches, uh, ulcers, uh, come from repressed uh, emotions that people aren't dealing with. So the repression of emotions uh, can cause a lot of physical harm to the body. And so, I have an, and there's another question from Thailand, uh, and it's actually uh, two questions, and that is, uh, how do I get over with life? Is God really fair to me when He took away my family and f and my and my future? And what kind of experience uh, did you have to face the stresses, the fears, and anxieties in order to write this book? And for whom are you writing for? I'm writing for everyone because of the common the the com the, the human experience is common. Uh, First Corinthians uh, uh, ten and thirteen says, "No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man." Uh, when King David died, he told his son Solomon, I'm about to go the way of all the earth. Uh, everybody in this world lives to the same common experience. Now, some of the particulars may be different uh, for people. Um, the first part of that question is interesting when the person asks, you know, what do I do? How do I get on with my life? When God took away my family. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world of difference of thinking that suffering comes because we're all living in this world versus blaming God. So a part of getting on with life depends on how you interpret it. If you, if you look at everything as God personally attacking you, uh, you're going to have a hard time getting on with life, and you're going to have a hard time even uh, having a concept of God. If you, re if you realize what the Bible teaches, that suffering is a part of living in a fallen, sinful world. It's everybody's lot once we sin. Uh, that's different than saying I've got to deal with the problems of life versus I've I got to deal now I'm in a war with God. So... I think the way people interpret why they're going through what they're going through is huge as to how they manage it. We have a question from Myanmar, and that is um, who has actually done a review of your book, and which we sent to. And uh, the question is, how do we know uh, what what is the what is God uh, has a has purpose for our lives? What, what that means, God? How do we know that God has purpose for our lives? And why is it that it's emotionally hard to part to participate in change? Uh, is there any easy way out? Because most of the because what it says is why is it is is mostly hard work to participate in change? Well, that's two questions. Uh, the way that we know God has a purpose for our lives is the first statement of the Bible: "In the beginning, God created." This is a statement of intentionality and purpose. Uh, an evolutionary model or pure evolutionary model would say the universe happened by random, by probability. A creation says it happened intentionally. Well, if it happened intentionally, then that very fact that there is a creator is what gives our lives a sense of, there's a reason for being here. So just understanding uh, the cosmos from a standpoint of creation and a divine initiative is what enables me to understand I'm a part of something God intentionally did, not something that accidentally happened. Uh, when we talk about change, uh, the reason change is difficult is because the, the natural tendency of systems is to stay the same. We call it the homeostatic balance. It's the, it's the state of um, systems in nature, in relationships, in business, in politics. Uh, so we, we, we naturally have a tendency to keep things the way they are. And the reason for that is the fear of the unknown is a far greater threat to us than even the discomfort of the known. So even though we're in a state that we say, I don't like my life, I don't like my family, yet we're used to it. And we say, well, if I change it, I don't even know what that is. And I may not like what is, but at least I know what's going on. So change is frightening to us because we don't know where it's going or what will happen. So because the, the fear of change is so great and the unpredictability of it, that's the one thing that tends to make us keep things the way that they are. And we have a question from Russia, and that is, it says, uh, Dear Dr. David Cooper, uh, what does it involve uh, or expectations in change? 
and also sec the second question, why do you say excuses and reasoning is bad? How can I overcome and face it? Does it happen uh, over, t over time? Is there an answer to this emotional or, or character flaw to this? Yeah, excuses. Uh, I talk about some of the common excuses that we do, like it's not my fault. Uh, rationalization, we excuse things. Uh, the reason excuses are unproductive is because it keeps us from taking charge of our lives. It takes the focus away from, for example, what can I do about this situation? And it puts the attention on, well, why this happened, or I don't blame myself, or I don't want to take responsibility. So excuse making tends to uh, disempower people, where accepting responsibility or accepting the uh, opportunity to make changes empowers us uh, to move on with our lives. Mm -hmm. Now we have a, a question from Australia. You have some fans there right now, and that Good. is, uh, and that is, uh, how do you define uh, responsibility and and accountability today? How different is it from our marketplace and being a person in faith? Question two: um, How long did it take you to discover all the flaws of mankind, and how did it how did it take you to uh, how long did it take you to write it? Was there a mentor that assist, to assist you in this painful experience in writing in this the book? book? Yes. No, nobody helped me write the book. It just comes through, uh, well, education, you know. I uh, spent my life studying um, theology and psychology, and then I'm a pastor, um, I'm a counselor, and I also have to live life. I'm a, a father and a, uh, a husband, so I live through the experiences of life. And as a counselor, I live through a lot of other people's experiences with them, so I'm able to draw on that. Uh, nobody helped me write the book. It's just a, it's just a kind of a collection of kind of where I am at this point of the things that I've learned uh, and the things that I've observed. The first part of the question I, uh, I forgot is something about ex about responsibility and accountability. Yeah. Responsibility, I think, is when a person can look at himself or herself and say, this is who I am. This is the job I have to do. This is the task I have to do in life, and I'm going to do it. It's their own personal commitment to fulfill their own purpose. And, and job and ministry in life. Accountability is to, is to look outside. Responsibility has to do with you. Accountability has to do with other people around you and God. My accountability is what do I owe the people in my life? And what do I owe the God who, who gave me? Responsibility is what do I owe myself, my own sense of integrity for, to fulfill faithfully, to live up to my potential. So accountability is uh, what I want to give my commitment to other people and to God. Responsibility is my commitment to myself. We have three, you have, uh, three questions from Japan uh, and uh, who has reviewed your book. And that is uh, for to dear Dr. David Cooper. Uh, how does one overcome fear of the future or uncertainty? Is living uncertainty good? What is your own personal observation of the global trends do you see today and the challenges? And three, how do I help and convince uh, my boyfriend or husband to be real to themselves or to their wives or to, the, or to their girlfriends? Uh, that's a lot. Uh, fear, I think there's, uh, fear is interesting. Uh, it'll never go away. It's part of the human experience. Uh, being able to identify what we're afraid of is important. Ask yourself a few questions. What's the worst thing that can happen to me today? What's the best thing? If the worst thing happens, what will I do? If the best thing happens to me, what will I do? One of the best ways of managing fear is to play the fear out in your mind and then ask yourself, well, if the worst thing happens, what would I do? That way the mind starts thinking about options as opposed to feeling like we don't have any. Most of the things we're afraid of will never even happen anyway. So I say go ahead and play the, the imaginary fear out. Um, and, and the a, second part, you have to remind me of the second part. The third the, part about the husband or boyfriend is um, to, un, to remember, uh, first of all, that men are less verbal than women. Uh, that's just a genetic reality. It has to do with the brain differences of the male and the female species. So women are much more verbal in the way that they express their thoughts and their feelings. So all women should know that about men. In comparison to females, men are not as verbal. So that's part of the maybe the problem she's identifying when she says they're not being real or maybe not expressing themselves. Uh, the, other, the other thing that a woman can do is tell her boyfriend or husband, and don't instead of preaching at him or telling him to talk more, say, honey, it makes me feel good when you talk to me, or I like it when you share um, what's going on in your life. 
So to demand something of somebody usually doesn't work, but to kind of change the same request into a statement to say, I like it when you do this, uh, might encourage him uh, to speak more openly. And then remember that if a man shares openly with you, don't attack him for it. You can't ask somebody to be honest, and then when they're honest, then you attack them. Hmm. So but sometimes people end up sabotaging the thing that they want in life. They ask for it, they get it, and then they, they, they get angry about it or get upset about it. So the man will naturally shut down. Because no man wants to make his girlfriend or his wife mad, so he figures, well, if I open my big mouth, I'm just going to hurt her, so I won't say anything. So if a woman asks for openness, she has to be willing to accept it when she gets it. And so uh, we're moving on. We have, quest we have three questions uh, from Vietnam. And uh, it's a pastor, actually, uh, who reviewed this book. And the, the question is uh, to Dr. David Cooper, and that is, uh, what is disappointment? How do we overcome uh, disappointments, uh, and what is, is and what is the mo motivation behind a disappointment? And the third question is uh, about the issue of anger. Is it is anger good, and how far should anger go? Um, how do we find healing in anger? Good question. Disappointment is the gap between what I expect to happen and what really happens. It's the distance between expectation and achievement. So if I expect to get an A on the test and I got a C and I've studied all night, then I'm disappointed. If I expected a perfect marriage and now I've got a mediocre marriage, then I'm disappointed. If I expected to have $1,000 for my Christmas bonus and I got $100, I'm disappointed. So one, one of the best ways of managing disappointment is to lower your expectations. Don't, don't, don't expect and demand so much. Uh, I, I think the more we demand of our of other people and ourselves, probably the more disappointed we're going to be. So make sure that our expectations are realistic, first of all. Second of all, remember that nobody is going to achieve every goal, and everything we expect is not going to happen. So we don't we need to not be as um, shocked. The Bible says that God has compassion on us in Psalm 103, verse 12 to 14, because he remembers that we are made from dust. So to me, that tells me that God doesn't expect as much of us as we think he does because he remembers we're just made from dust and how much can you expect from a handful of dirt anyway? Uh, anger, is anger a good emotion? Apparently it's a good emotion because God gave it to us. It's, it's one of God's emotions. Uh, there, are about, there are over 450 references to anger in the Bible. 375 refer to the anger of God. So anger is a natural, healthy emotion. But now if we don't know how to manage it or express it, it can become a very dangerous and detrimental emotion. So the most important thing about anger is to kind of know why you're angry. Is it because you're expecting too much or somebody, you know, hurt you? And then admit that you're angry. Talk to somebody about it. Even, you know, pray your anger out. Express that anger. And even if you feel like you got to write a letter to somebody and tell them how bad you feel and how mad you are, don't hold the anger in. And it'll quickly subside. Now, if anger turns into rage and people get violent or they get abusive verbally, that will only make them get more angry. So expressing anger in unhealthy ways only makes angry people more angry. So I would say talk about it, tell the person you're mad about it, and you'll find that uh, it'll start to subside. Another question, and that is from Singapore alone, uh, and uh, from a pastor here at... Um, in Singapore. Uh, dear Dr. Uh, David Cooper, could you, could you tell us um, a little bit more about resentment and what is the difference between resentment and anger? What is the root cause on how, what is the root cause and how do we get rid of it? And another question uh, also from Singapore, uh, there are actually four questions about failure. Uh, is it good to fail to gain experience and what are the ne negative impacts of it? Have you failed before? Uh, in your ministry and as a leader, and how did you overcome uh, fail failure? And the, the other two two more questions is about overcoming uh, inadequacy and handling uh, criticism uh, as That's a leader. That's a lot for a question. Yeah. Okay. We'll just handle um, one at a time. We'll, yeah. The fir we'll, the first one was on um, res resentment versus anger. Resentment. Yes. Yeah. Um, I once read that resentment is the most common form of unfinished business. I think E. Stanley Jones, who was a missionary, a Methodist missionary in India, I think he wrote that statement. Resentment is the most common form of unfinished business. 
Uh, I would say that anger is more situational. Something happens and I'm mad. Resentment is when that anger has become so deeply entrenched to me, it's aimed at a person. I think we get anger about things that happen. We get resentful toward people. And it becomes an ongoing perpetual attitude toward a person. Uh, resent, one of the great stories of resentment in the Bible is when Joseph's brothers, the ones that, uh, they didn't just hate him, they were resentful of the relationship he had with his dad. And of course, they end up uh, selling him to some uh, traveling gypsies through town, and Joseph ends up in prison in Egypt. Uh, resentment is deep-seated. Um, it's become the perpetual attitude. People resent this person as opposed to just being angry about something that happened. Um, I think when people are perpetually angry and resentful, they should ask themselves one question. What's the payoff? What am I really getting out of this? There's not one thing that's been accomplished. I think when people are angry, they actually in their minds imagine they're punishing the person they're angry at, or they're and they're not. The only thing they're doing is making themselves incredibly miserable. They put themselves in a state of depression uh, that wreaks havoc on their own physical body with psychosomatic diseases. So I would say the difference of anger is it's kind of situational and resentment is aimed at a person. Uh, the second was about failure. Have I failed in my ministry? Uh, absolutely, failures are part of life. You know, failure has to do with setting goals and we don't always reach those goals. Uh, I think there's no way to live in this world and not fail at something. So uh, the only way you'll never fail is you don't try anything. Um, in Micah, it says, Micah 7, verse 8, and Micah says in the prophet, don't gloat over me, my enemy, though I've fallen, I will rise. So I think when people fail, they need, it's just like riding a bicycle when you're a kid. The point is to get back up and get back on the bicycle again. The, ult, the ultimate failure is when you let failure be the last chapter of your life. It's up to you and me whether or not you want to write another chapter or not. I was asked one time to write a chapter on failure. They had some ministers in Atlanta. Each, each pastor was writing a, a chapter on some personal experiences. So I wrote a chapter on failure, sent it in. They said, we don't, this, this is not what we want. Write us another one. Well, I, that was kind of strange to me. So I wrote them another chapter, and they sent it back and said, no, this is not what we want. So I thought, this is ridiculous. I failed twice at writing a chapter on failure. So they sent an editor out here just to interview me to tell some stories. That was always a paradox. I couldn't even write a chapter on failure, and I was telling them about failures. So uh, failure is not a big deal. It's only a big deal if you make it a big deal, because it can be the last chapter of your life. It's up to you to decide whether or not you say, well, I'll just get up and write another chapter. When my brother started business, my older brother's a businessman, and I started the church at the same time, and I was very afraid of failing at the church. I was worried about everything. We just had 12 people trying to start a church, and and I said, let me ask you something. I said, what if your business went bankrupt? What would you do? He said, if I just start another business. And it just struck me that it didn't even, he didn't have any anxiety about being busy. He didn't worry. If he went bankrupt, he just filed bankruptcy and started another business. But the attitude that he had, uh, of not being afraid to try something. That's why he eventually became successful. And so that, that over time that helped me. So what if, you know, so what if you have to close that bill now? So what if you have to end that ministry? Uh, start another one. And about the inadequacy, the third yes. thing about inadequacy, everybody feels inadequate. I mean, that's um, most people I know. I certainly do. Um, I like the story of jo Joshua in the Bible who took over for Moses. I think he probably felt as inadequate as anybody. I mean, Moses had manna from heaven, water from a rock, part of the Red Sea. Um, Moses he has miracles. I mean, Joshua has nothing like that. So I would think it'd be very hard to follow Moses. You know, I think uh, no, no wonder he didn't want the job. Uh, when God spoke to Joshua, though, in the first chapter of Joshua, three times he said, be strong and courageous. He told him that three times. So I think one of the ways to overcome inadequacy is to realize um, you do have certain gifts and talents and abilities, and if you go out there and be yourself and put your best foot forward, give it your best shot, you're going to succeed at something. I think a lot of inadequacy comes when you compare yourself to somebody else. Uh, when I took this church over, uh, I followed our pastor who'd been here for 37 years, and somebody said, well, you got some big shoes to fill. I said, I'm not filling anybody's shoes, I, and I got my own shoes on. So I think people feel inadequate if they compare themselves with somebody else. One of the great keys of overcoming that is just be who you are. And about the 
criti criticism. Uh, how do you uh, handle criti criticism as a leader? Well, I don't like. I don't have much of a stomach for it. I don't like to be criticized. I have a very weak ego. So, and I've never received much criticism. I think the Lord's protected me. When I get a criticism, <clears throat> if somebody were if somebody were to criticize me. I would agree with them. If they said, you're a poor leader, I'd say, you're absolutely right. If they said that was a bad sermon, I'd say, I'm the first to agree with you. I don't think I'm a great preacher. Or I don't even see myself as a leader. So, uh, it, I mean, it hurts, but, but I don't think that much of myself in the first place. If they criticize the church or the ministry or something that goes on, I always thank them for their input, say, I appreciate your input. You know, we're going to pray about it, see if we can use it. I never attack them back. I just thank them for I take criticism and turn it into a suggestion and thank them for it. We have, a, we have uh, three questions uh, from Indonesia, uh, who has uh, read uh, the review of your book. And, I'll, I'll, and these are the three questions. Uh, dear, past, uh, dear Pastor uh, Dr. David Cooper, uh, tell us more about leadership. Uh, what role do leaders play today? You know, and do you think we lack good leadership today? How can we develop good leadership, and what does it take to, uh, to produce uh, good leaders? Well, I've met a lot of great leaders in my life, so I don't I don't know if we're lacking good leaders or not. Um, second of all, I don't consider myself to be a leader, but I guess it probably comes with the territory. But I would say the thing the thing that distinguishes a leader is his or her ability to see the future and to lead the group of people he or she has toward the future. A manager sees what's in the present. They manage what's in front of them. A leader sees where the world is going, and they try to take people to the future. Uh, and that's, that's the challenge, because the leader sees things that aren't even happening right now. And you can see the great, if you look at the great uh, discoveries in the world or the technological advancements, these are people that envision where the world is going. So a leader sees the future, and then he or she tries to motivate the people in the present to go for the future. It's kind of like Moses coming out of Egypt, you know. They're stuck in Egypt. He sees the promised land. He's always trying to get them uh, to move forward to the promised land. And even Moses failed at doing that, if you think about it. Moses never got the people into Israel. And sometimes leaders even get stuck. They got the people out of the problem, but they never got them into the promise. So leadership itself is an extremely difficult task. And the leader is usually frustrated because he or she sees where things are going and says, we need to get ready for it. But most people live in the moment, and it's a very difficult thing to, to move people forward to where the world is going. Now, uh, and, the other, and the second question is uh, from Indonesia, and that is, uh, do you demand more from yourself? And how did you convince your members to look beyond themselves as we read the book? And how important uh, is it to look beyond yourselves? I, I demand a lot of myself. That's why I'm always disappointed in myself. Um, yeah, I teach people, like in their faith, to definitely, you know, I'll leave that statement in Hebrews, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 3, 1, let us fix our thoughts on Jesus. Um, I think as a, um, as a believer, I want to focus my vision upward on God. I never want to live my life like an atheist who doesn't see God, not conscious of God. And then I want to focus my eyes on other people. What are their needs? What are their interests? And put put them ahead of myself. And that puts me into perspective. If I put myself first, it's gonna uh, it's gonna change and warp all of my relationships. But if I think about if I wake up this morning and I tell God good morning and I live with an awareness that I'm here because the Creator gave me life, and then I'm very conscious of the people around me, looking at them. What do these people look like today? What do they need? What do the people in my life need? It redefines how I live my day, and it keeps me from being the center of my whole world. The, the last question for Indonesia, and that is um, from from a uh, from a critic, and that is, um, could you tell us more about self worth? How can I convince myself that I'm, uh, that I am important to the society today, and how do I know that I have a purpose? Well, I go back to Genesis. I think in many respects, Genesis is the most important book of the Bible. If you don't understand Genesis, you don't get anything else in the Bible. In the beginning, God created, and he made us in his own image. The very fact, I would say that the very fact that you are alive ought to tell you you're significant.
You're not here by accident. So uh, coming to terms with the fact that you do live and you live because the creator gave you life is what gives you a sense of dignity and worth and value. And to, 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 to look at the gifts and talents and abilities you have and to realize that somebody in your world needs you. If the world around you didn't need you, you wouldn't even exist. And I think if people also will get out there and do something for other people, you kind of discover your purpose by doing. If you see a poor guy on the street, stop and help him. If your church has a need in it, you know, sign up and volunteer. Many people discover their purpose if they'll actually go and meet a need that's standing right before them. You know, take a mission trip and go somewhere around the world, people that you've never met before. People will discover, and then I will discover their purpose sitting in a prayer closet waiting for God to show them their purpose. If they get out there and get, go visit a prison or something, go, you know, go feed some people in a, in a soup line where people are homeless. If you get out there and get involved in people's lives, you'll discover your purpose by doing. You'll never find it sitting in a prayer closet asking God to show it to you. And and now it's my turn to ask you a question once again, uh, Dr. David Cooper, and that is, uh, could you share with us uh, three key points of what you have learned after you have uh, written un the book, your book, Unfinished Business? Uh, three key points what you have learned after you have written. The first, the first list is don't write any more books. I tell myself that after because you know writing books are kind of tiring, but. Um, uh, the, the first thing I learned is the importance of journaling your thoughts and experiences. A book like that, for example, that comes out of a lot of my experiences and study is really me journaling that. And I think the first thing I would say to people is you can do that. You kind of can write your own book with your emails, with Twitter, with Facebook. Journaling your thoughts and feelings and sharing them with people around you uh, can enrich their lives. Uh, the second thing I learned is that if I have a gift for writing, uh, I should use it. And I've always wanted to, to write. I love, uh, I've written music and books and preaching. Now, I'm kind of a creative person. And I meet a lot of people who have a creative design, a desire, but they never do anything with it. Uh, that's the second thing that came back to me is when you have something creative within you, you need to express it. It may just be a small number of people who read it, uh, uh, but it can enrich their lives. Uh, the third thing I'm learning right now is how incredible this world is that I can be sitting here on Skype having a conversation with people all over the world about what was in my head. And if I'd never taken the thoughts in my head and written them, I would never meet you today and wouldn't uh, be having people all over the world uh, read it. So I'm, I'm learning, again, if you use your gifts and talents and abilities, it'll cause you to meet people in your life you would have never met unless you get outside of your comfort zone and express yourself. And what's next for you, uh, Dr. David Cooper? What's next for well, you? I'm going to release a solo guitar CD before Christmas where I'd, I'd usually do music with a band, so I've been learning solo guitar the last four years. So that's I'm working on that right now. And I'm working on another daily devotional, but it'll, I'm about halfway through it. I don't write that too fast because I like the thoughts to be fresh You know, when I have them. Uh, where there's like a, a small article for 365 days uh, of the year. Those are the those are two things I'm working on right now. Uh, any plans to uh, coming to come by it in Southeast Asia and throughout the world someday? One of my best one of my best friends lives in Indonesia. We went to college together. Tommy and Poppy Smith. Uh, they've been missionaries there for a long time since we got out of college. I don't have any. I've been invited. I haven't come yet. I've been to India. I uh, spent three weeks in South India, and one thing I want to do is walk on, or go for a jog on the Great Wall of China. I'd love to do that one day in my life. Uh, I eat Chinese food just about every day at one local restaurant, so I definitely need to visit China somewhere before it's over. <laughs> now, if God gave you one wish, what would be that one thing One one thing that you would wish for? If God, I, 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 don't, I don't have any wishes. I've been I've been fortunate to live a very blessed life. I don't I don't have any request of God. But well, once again, uh, Dr. David Cooper, thank you for sharing with us here at the National Critics Choice and for your upcoming book, Unfinished Business is now open for pre-ordering uh, with Amazon.com, Barnes and Nobles, and all uh, leading good bookstores uh, around the world. I'm Robin Steinberg. Thank you for watching and have a good week ahead. Okay.